We are examining the first principles of the spiritual realm to help us to understand uh, about that spiritual realm and ultimately the person of the Holy Spirit. And so in laying down the groundwork to try and understand spirits and personal spirits, I want to talk about geographic spirits. Um, and so it's interesting to me that uh, there was one time that a pastor said to me that there was no such thing as geographic spirits. Spirits just involve themselves with people. And because of that, the spirit just needed to be casted out, cast out, and then it, it would be done. Well, then, uh, as I actually started studying the Bible, instead of just listening to what people told me and believing and accepting what they told me, I realized that actually the Bible teaches that there are geographic spirits. And um, I think that there are many examples of this. I'm going to give three. But I just want to make a point before I do that, that, that people... And so you're a person, I'm a person, but also Satan is a person, the archangel Gabriel is a person, um, the um, angel, whatever angel is a person, whatever demon is a person, they are persons. They have a, a fixed beginning. In other words, they aren't eternal. There was some point whenever they didn't exist and then another point when they started to exist, right? And they also are not um, omnipresent, which means that just like you do not fill the universe, you don't even fill your house, you don't fill your town, right? You don't fill your state, like not even remotely close. Um, neither does anybody else. There may be people that are bigger than you, for example, um, there may be a principality spirit that is way up in the heavenly realms and is way bigger than you are and way bigger than I am, but they're still finite, right? And they don't, um, they don't fill the entire earth. They only are in sort of like a part of the earth. And so um, my point in saying all this is that persons are inherently tied to geography because they can only be in one place at one time. You can't be here in Japan at the same time and the human mind and, and uh, the rational human spirit or any rational spirit cannot make sense of two things being in two different places at the same time, right? So, um, and so, you know, like God God being omnipresent and filling the entire universe, I'd say that's super hard for us to understand because that's just um, not not our experience of things because we are, um, as I have already stated, finite beings. And so the first um, scriptures that I want to read are out of Daniel um, chapters 10 and 12. Um, so 10 verses 12 to 21. So Daniel is fasting and praying for God and God sends an angel to meet Daniel and we learn about um, what happened to this angel in the process of going to meet Daniel. So Daniel chapter 10 verse 12. Then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is a demonic spirit, right? And you listen to the properties of it and you learn. Um, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. We learn from Paul and First Thessalonians and elsewhere that Michael is an archangel. So then we're getting additional clues that we're talking about something spiritual here and not just like little princes starting about or whatever. Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come. Um, and of course, you know, this, this is an angel that's visiting Daniel, right? Okay. Now I am come to make thee understand which shall befall thy people in the latter days for... 
um, yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words to me, I set my face towards the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and spake, and I said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision of sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straight away there remained no strength in me, neither is there no breath in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come to thee? And now will I return to fight the prince of Persia. So we have an angel fighting this prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia, Greece, shall come forth. But I will show thee uh, that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. Um, and then uh, Daniel 12 chapter 12 verse 1 at that time Michael shall stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of the people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time the people shall be delivered everyone shall be found written in the book and so the the point of me reading all of this is to recognize that an angel is speaking to Daniel that an angel in his um, process of trying to get to Daniel withstood me one in 20 days. So uh, three weeks he was trying to get to Daniel, but, but something withheld him. Of course, we know that it's absurd that, that a man, even a prince or a king, could stop an angel. Um, we know there are examples in the Bible of one angel with a flaming sword getting ready to destroy Jerusalem, an entire city. And so the idea that one little man, even if he is a king, can stop an angel is absurd. I mean, it's utterly absurd. The angel can just stay invisible and the king would never even know the difference, right? So um, we have the man talking to Daniel, which is an angel. We have the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which is an adversary. We have Michael, who is an uh, archangel, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And then we know that there's another prince of, of Grecia, Greece. And then we also tie, um, read in 12.1 that uh, Michael is a great prince which standeth up for the children of thy people, which is Israel, right? And so Im immediately reading this, we have three spiritual powers which are tied to geographical regions. Grecia, Persia, and Israel. And of course... It makes sense. Why would there only be um, angels or demons of three countries, but yet we know that there are more than 200 countries in the world today, right? And so the idea that there's angels of three countries but not of the rest is silly. I mean, it's, it's very silly, right? And uh, we also know that because spirits are um, finite personal beings... They can only be at one place at one time. And so does it make sense to have an army go to the United States, then to go to China, then to go to Japan, then to go back to the United States, then go back to North Korea, and then go to the South Korea, and then go over to the Cayman Islands, and then just... I mean, if you're spending all of your time traveling, you can't do anything, right? And so doesn't it make a lot of sense to stay in basically one place so that you can actually get something done instead of spending all your time zipping about traveling, right? Um, persons are inherently tied to geography. Um, Genesis chapter 3 verses 23 through 24. And so this is after Adam, Eve, and the serpent had been judged by God. And God booted Adam and Eve, uh, the first eviction notice in history, uh, he booted Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a cherub to guard the garden. 
Um, the garden is in a physical location. It's not bouncing around the universe. It's in one place, probably somewhere in Mesopotamia, right? Uh, maybe somewhere near Iraq or Saudi Arabia or, or some, some such place in the Middle East. Um, that's where it's at. And so God tells the cherub, you go there, then guess what? The cherub is in that place, right? Uh, so Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden till the ground from whence he was taken, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, right? And so those cherub were placed and stationed by God as Yahweh uh, Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, and he, he placed them in a, in a geographic location. Geographic spirit, right? Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And they came over unto the other side of the sea in the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thy unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered him, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was... There nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. The unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about two thousand, and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see see at what was done and they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid and they saw it and they that saw it told them how it befell them that how, how it befell to him that was possessed of the devil and also concerning the swine and they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts and when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And so... Um, there's many markers here. Um, this man who is possessed with this legion, um, this, the spirits are there. They just happen to be using the man as a vessel, right? And so the spirits are um, dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him, not even with chains. He would just snap them off. Um, neither could any man tame him out of verse 4. Um, so he was just inhabiting that general area. And his countenance and his presence was so fierce that nobody could even pass that way. And all the people of the region were terrorized by this guy and ultimately the legion of demons that was inside of him. Um, skipping down to uh, verse 18, the um, sometimes he's called the demoniac, uh, who has now been set in his right mind asked that he could go with Jesus. Um, verse 19, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath 
had compassion on thee. And so the interesting thing is, is that the place where these legions occupied their territory, their geography, right? Um, Jesus ended up casting them out. Also recall one point that I had missed. Um, verse 10, And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country, like somewhere far away, because that's where they were stationed, right? That was their place. That was where they were supposed to be. And so they didn't want Jesus interfering with their plans, though he's God and he can, you know, they clearly recognized his supremacy, don't torment me, right? Uh, they wanted to stay where they were at. Right? There was a reason why they wanted to stay where they're at. So um, the spirits that had had such great influence of uh, terror, terrorizing the people of this region, ended up being cast out. You know, why would they want to go in a bunch of animals and then drive the animals to be drowned? And then, you know, what after that? I don't know. Um, but so the spirits are cast out of the region and then Jesus sends a messenger, an ambassador of the kingdom to preach in the very same area that uh, he had experienced deliverance and perhaps by implication um, that they could experience deliverance as well. Basically, he's preaching the gospel to them. And so... Um, these are three different examples of spirits inhabiting geographical regions because they are personal and finite beings just like you and me.